Good morning to everybody. This is Stefano Ambrosini, Master in Geopolitics from Italy. Uh, today we have a special guest uh, from, uh, from Canada, uh, David De Tomasi, uh, that is an associate professor of international business at the Smith uh, School of Business and uh, um, he specialized also uh, in, in the field of energy and gas uh, and uh, and for sure about uh, business. So uh, the idea is like uh, um, to invite him uh, to the stream uh, because uh, the next part of the streams uh, it will not be only about uh, uh, military and uh, geopolitics, but I would be interested to talk also about energy and the scenario that will be in the next years about uh, this field. So uh, I will firstly give to you the stand. So please, if you want to say something more to introduce yourself and and I will put your slides. Thanks a lot to be with us. Well, you're very welcome. And welcome to you and welcome to everyone who might be tuning in either now or in the, uh, the post uh, period. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. My name is David Didamassi. Um, I am a professor of international business at uh, the Smith School of Business in Kingston, Ontario, hence my slides. And I've been studying the politics and geopolitics of oil for a decade now or more. And I've recently published a book on it, which I'll highlight in a moment. I also want to make sure that you know that I'm, I am speaking of this as a Canadian. Um, and uh, one of the things that's critical about that is I grew up with oil and gas in literally in my backyard. I grew up in a place in southern Alberta where people extracted oil and gas and sold it on an international marketplace. And that was the lifeblood of our economy. So that kind of conditioned my feeling and my thinking about the industry and has conditioned how I've looked at it ever since. And so my viewpoints will kind of reflect that. But it's also clear that that industry matters enormously to the international environment because this is the world's biggest business by any measure. And we are being reawakened to it right now about the geopolitics of it. So uh, with that, that's sort of my introduction. And I look forward to handling any questions that you have. I've got about you know, 10 or 12 slides that I will go through in, in reasonable amount of detail, but not too much to give you a lay of where we were. And then I'm gonna make some finish up with the commentary about where we're going to go. So let's talk a little bit about something I like to think about. And I want always to remember is that the current state and future prospects of oil and gas are products of human choice. Um, and I like to open up with these quotes that I sometimes use in my classrooms, uh, which is the infamous resource curse, which was uttered by Juan Pablo Alfonso in 1975 about the dangers of having oil and gas in your own country. Whereas if they are improperly developed, they are effectively working as the devil's excrement. And they certainly did that in Venezuela where people essentially saw their government crumble through the mismanagement of oil and gas revenues over the past two decades, and we've left a forward with what we've got today. Tom Friedman of the New York Times, famous argument about the inverse law of geopolitics of oil, that the pace of freedom and democracy in the world is inversely proportional to the price of a barrel of oil. And, uh, but my third one that I really wanna emphasize is, is the third quote, and that is this idea, is that there's nothing inevitable about the geopolitics of oil being what they are. Um, they are a product of human choice. And as such, we have to understand where those choices come from because we can make different ones. And I would argue to you the present problems that we currently have, low supply, high prices, lack of cer certainty are indeed products of our own choices and we can make different ones. So I'm going to outline why I think that over the next 10, 15 minutes and uh, then I'll also talk a little bit about where they might lead us in the future. So let's talk a little bit about that. All right, the next slide that we talked a little bit about is remember this. I wrote the book as a Canadian largely because I was dismayed about two things. One is people had very, very strong opinions about the oil and gas industry, and increasingly they were almost uniformly negative. People did not like it wished it didn't exist, thought it was contributing to a climate catastrophe. And if we didn't stop using it immediately, um, we would all die in a ball of raging fire. And secondarily, people didn't really know how the oil industry worked, where it came from, or why it generated the outline that it did. 
and they didn't understand how deeply dependent they were just to live on a functioning oil and gas sector, particularly in Canada, which has a tendency to get very cold. And so I wanted to put us talking a little bit about where we actually are in the oil and gas sector system and how dependent we are on oil and gas and carbon-based products still and what we can do about them in the future. So that's the next one I'll talk a little bit about is this one. All right, this is cribbed from the International Energy Agency, which recently released its, an, its annual World Energy Outlook. And it's the place where I kind of look to get the most reliable statistics on energy and energy expenditures. And even with the current emphasis on transitioning away from carbon-based fuels, we have an enormously long way to go. Now, the most recent figures I've been able to put together is that in 2000, the world drew about 86% of its energy from carbon-based sources and another 14 from non-carbon-based sources, windmills, renewables, um, nuclear. And today, that percentage has dropped to about 84 in this essence, with all the emphasis we placed on renewable energy and wind and solar and other sorts of things, we have not made a material dent in our use of carbon-based products in the overall energy mix, which is what this graph talks about. Oil has, has more than doubled in use since 1990 to 2017. So is natural gas. So is coal. Um, and the stuff in the middle is what we broadly might call renewable. And even if renewable sectors are growing quickly, they still are dwarfed by what we see as the carbon-based based products, natural gas, coal, and oil. So how can this be? Well, we have made enormous strides in the efficiency and gains in renewable sources of energy, and we should continue to do that. You know, solar and power and wind power is now economically on par or cheaper with in most places um, what you can get from natural gas. But the overall demand of energy in the world has grown exponentially and has more than outpaced the growth in the individual part we might talk about renewables. Um, population in the world continues to increase. It's over 8 billion now. And all of those 8 billion people want and need improving standards of living and the most secure place that you can go for right now to get that stuff remains oil and natural gas. And the overall ball of energy demand has grown faster and enough that we will not be able to meet and to replace oil and gas and meet that additional demand without enormous investments in all energy sectors. So uh, it is not realistic in my view to think about replacing oil and natural gas in the overall energy mix. We can talk about the targets that were placed in the uh, COP27 and other sorts of places in the, oil, in the chat, but we're still very heavily dependent and all our investment seems to indicate that as well. Now, what has happened in the oil sector with the one that I've talked about the most? Well, a couple of things. One is, yes, the last 18 months, well, actually maybe 14 months, have seen a vast increase in the price of a barrel of oil. But that has come off of almost a full decade where oil and gas prices were subdued, and they fell dramatically in the fall of 2014. They were cut literally in half, and then down almost another third, largely because an overall glut in the system kept supplies plentiful. And as we're going to see in the next slide, we have lots of new suppliers coming onto the system in oil and natural gas, particularly the fracking revolution in the United States. Okay, what this has meant is I think we have been lulled into believing that we had plenty of oil and natural gas and that prices would remain low forever because we've had eight years of precisely that. Now, what this led was a complacency on the part of individuals about how dependent we were on oil and natural gas to an assumption that they would remain cheap or relatively cheap and the supplies would be available. And three, we sort of discounted how dependent we currently were and how much of a boost this gave to our overall economies. These are all feedstocks to everything we make, every factory that runs and has made us overall economic growth stronger because of this. Now, 
when you have almost eight to 10 years of loyal oil prices and a glut and combined with what we would argue is a global kind of emphasis on stopping the use of carbon, which we see in the Paris Climate Change Accords of 2015, we've seen in subsequent international agreements, there's been a general consensus, in fact, an overwhelming movement today that is being exhibited by individuals who are gluing themselves to the walls of, of museums after throwing soup on major paintings, right? We have assumed um, that we can easily and quickly transition away from this and need to do it in terms of renewable energy. Now, when faced with a lot of public anger or disapproval, when faced with low prices, when faced with increasing regulatory constraints of where and how much oil companies can drill, not surprisingly, what they did was this. They stopped spending money on exploring for new oil and gas development. Now, in the heightened periods of high prices, 2012, 2013, you're getting in the neighborhood of $800 billion a year being spent on new oil and gas development. And that has been cut almost in half. And between 2018 and 2020, I didn't even update this to reflect pandemic figures, that fell by another third. So global oil and gas investment in new supplies in two, fell to about $200 billion US dollars during the height of the pandemic. Now, what does that mean? It means you're setting up for a stage of shortage because in order to maintain that even supply to the market, you need to be spending two, three, four hundred billion dollars a year each and every year just to replace the fields that you are declining in terms of current production. And companies weren't doing that. It wasn't profitable to do it. Their shareholders were increasingly demanding that they not and invest more of that money into renewable sources. The demand didn't have went through the floor during the pandemic. And so for about four or five years, you've had major oil and gas companies, both private and not for and, and state owned, the stuff that you see in Saudi Arabia, reducing this investment in new, new development in terms of supply. Not surprisingly, when you act, come up in 2022 and we recover out of the pandemic, the global economy starts a period of recovery. Um, we don't have enough supply in the system. Oil prices shoot through the roof. They propel inflation because everything becomes more expensive because you've got to be able to pay for that more expensive oil and natural gas you are using. And we've got a shortage. You throw in a war, which was, you know, um, perhaps not entirely unpredicted, but certainly the timing of it was something to be concerned about and a cutoff of natural gas to Western Europe, and all of a sudden, oil and gas prices shoot through the roof and people wonder what the heck happened. But a lot of it is has been about how we have done and managed oil and gas in the past. How have we done that? All right, take a look. A couple of things, all right. One is, is the revolution in the US export capacity of oil and natural gas got hit a little bit during the Biden administration, but still is very strong. And what I think you're going to see, particularly in the result of the midterms we just went through, is probably a reinvigoration of, North, of US oil and gas production simply because of the political demands that they do so. Um, you know, a lot of the current oil and natural gas producers in the world remain overwhelmingly dependent on selling oil and natural gas to the global economy. That's what's in the bottom right hand corner. Iraq, Libya, Venezuela, Algeria, Kuwait, Sudan, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia sell almost nothing else. And their economy is almost no, entirely based on selling oil and natural gas to the global economy. Now, it's not quite sure we want to do that. Perhaps we want to have a bit more of diversity of supply, largely coming from the U.S. and increasingly possibly coming from Canada. Canada has currently got the third largest oil and gas natural supplies in the world in terms of reserves. And we are the world's fifth biggest uh, producer of oil and natural gas, oil especially, most of it coming from Alberta oil sands. And I make the argument in my upcoming book that it's in the interest of the world and of Canada to raise the amount of oil and gas produced to the system because it A, stops the reliance on these countries who many of whom are dictatorships and many of whom who follow domestic political patterns we don't like, weakens Russia over a longer period of term, 
and allows the world to move away from coal, which is the number one priority if we want to be able to meet our overall commitments in terms of reducing carbon emissions. So what are the standard geopolitical problems that uh, we have in here that uh, an oil importers always think about? Um, there's a cycle. When prices are low, they stop thinking about it. They think supply is guaranteed. Uh, we want to have more markets. We want to be able to make sure that we gain oil and gas supplies abroad. And we have a better trade balance because we're spending less money on oil and natural gas. Like now, in times of high oil prices, we freak out. We worry about security of supply. We worry about cost. We worry about whether or not the market itself will ever supply it again. In the United States and Canada, you get calls for windfall taxes because they are making so much money from the high oil and gas prices. And so you get the same sort of patterns of political response in times of high and low oil prices. They're ignored when prices are low and uh, they are hurt. They are overwhelmingly paid attention to when prices are high. And I would argue you need a little bit of a moderation of both of those sorts of things. So I won't go through too much more. I just want to go through about, yeah, five or six more slides. Um, I'm going to give this to you, and I'm not going to go through it in too much detail, because this is just the summary of the politics and the geopolitics of oil and natural gas that are always there. There's five or six big ones. Security of supply for those that import it. Security of demand for those that must export it, because they have almost nothing else to export, and they need to sell the money, sell their oil somewhere. That's number one. Um, what does this need to procure oil do for geopolitics? Does it make countries so overwhelmingly dependent on oil importers that they will ignore or not pay attention to some of the, some of the effects or the activities of oil producing countries? Classic example in the United States during the Trump administration was the assassination of a journalist. Okay, are you willing to tolerate that in order to ensure that you get oil supplies flowing? More recently, we had Joe Biden going to Saudi Arabia to try to ensure that they kick in their oil supplies higher because we have high prices. So how overall foreign policy priorities get taken up by this particular problem? Three, will oil and natural gas, will high prices and shortages today, what will they do to the renewable agenda, particularly in Europe, which has led the way on this? Will they realize that there has to be some sort of backup and reinvigorate in terms of their natural gas, oil, and nuclear problems? Or will they believe and, can, and double down on a, the green agenda, which is what the German government has said, but isn't increasingly doing? So security, supply, and what will this do to our overall kind of emphasis on moving towards renewables? Will it slow it down? Will it speed it up? Or some combination, depending on where you happen to be. So let's talk a little bit about um, the next book. And then I'll talk, I'll summarize talking about where I think things will be going. Um, that was the first book that I wrote. And I argued, I wrote it um, largely because of the ignorance that I was talking about earlier and the fact that people simply didn't know what they were talking about. What I would like to do is in the next book is I'm making the model from Steven Pinker, who's a psychologist in Harvard, who's written a lot of books about rationality and how the mind works. And I argue that we need to examine, bring geopolitically the debate back into the rational point where we recognize some of the key realities I just talked about and plot a path forward that avoids some of these extremes I've been talking about, right? It simply argues that yes, for the foreseeable future, in order to maintain a standard of living that we want and to be able to ensure growth, particularly in emerging poor areas of the world, we're gonna be reliant on oil and natural gas. And there's no way easily to get around that and given where we are right now. However, we can plot a path to a cleaner future that involves fossil fuels by re-emphasizing technology that lowers the level of carbon emissions, putting more investments into renewables, and making sure we have a wide distribution of energy so that there isn't this problem of energy poverty in emerging markets, which causes political disruption and causes a lot of pain and suffering there. 
So I think we need to navigate forward in 2022 and going forward um, a way to balance the contending approaches. There are some who argue that we need to, you know, this is the basic idea of the rational approach. All right, we need to calm down. We need to focus on what our national interests clearly are, which in the case of the geopolitics of energy is security of supply at a reasonable cost and to have reasons why we should supply one from the other. And I also think that we need to reinvigorate. One of the things I'm worried about, and it's, it's not often talked about, but it's, it seems very prevalent in the young people I teach, many of whom are from Europe who do our exchange students, um, is a very unhealthy pessimism about the state of the world. A lot of it having to do with this fairly consistent flow of information towards them that tends to believe that the environmental problems we face are insurmountable and that we can't do anything about it. it it's creating a very powerful pessimism among our young people that I worry very much about because they're the ones that are going to have to live with this, but they're also the ones that are going to start the businesses and create the technologies that's going to help us solve it. And so to reinstill some sort of optimism that the environmental challenges associated with the carbon-based economy are solvable is the reason why I think we ought to, ought to look at, you know, this in a more rational sort of way. Now, a couple of geopolitical things I'll finish up with. In fact, I'll, I'll think I'll stop speaking here because I've been doing it for about 20 minutes and I know that there's some questions in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the chat. What I think is going to happen geopolitically is the following. One is, is that there's a realization that a diverse source of oil and natural gas supply is critical. And we, lots of us in the political politics community have been warning Europe for a long period of time that's been overwhelmingly dependent on Russian natural gas. And we've seen where that leads us today. So how do we face the fact that we're still dependent on it? It's very expensive. Well, we will likely see more export platforms being built from other places in supply. Um, there'll be an increasing political will to do that, particularly as we have seen how expensive oil and natural gas is if you're not investing critically. Um, I don't think it will critically endanger the renewable um, drive because that's, that's built into the cake now. People are very much aware on the problems of climate change. They are willing to support policies that are designed to mitigate it. And I don't think we need to be phrasing this as an either or debate. I think we can do both, both in North America and Europe. And as that energy supply grows, a larger proportion of that bubble will increasingly migrate away from oil and natural gas and towards other sources of energy. But I think it will take longer and require more patience than we are currently exhibiting. So that's about 25 minutes. Um, I'm uh, gonna stop there and start feel, unless there's, uh, if that's okay, and uh, we can maybe start fielding some questions either from the moderator or from what anyone's coming up in, in the chat. Perfect. So I, I already collected a lot of questions for you, like uh, sure. something from previous presentation and uh, something during. So, uh, okay. Uh, starting from this one, there is like a, um, a report uh, just uh, went out from ENG, like with, with yeah. Islam, um, a Netherlands banks. Uh, it is said like that when nat natural gas prices came under a significant pressure in October due to milder weather and the growing e European storage, oil prices uh, have been uh, relatively stable following the recent announcement of the OPEC uh, plus supply cuts. Uh, despite the, uh, the recent weakness, the 2023 outlook remained bullish. What do you think about it? Because we saw that the prices went up and up and up, uh, over 300 uh, euro for the gas, and then returned back uh, uh, very fastly when uh, when there was like probably like this extremely hot winter for Europe. Uh, and I don't know what so is far. your point of view. Sure, great question. A uh, couple of things about that. One, you're right. The, the questioner was right in the sense that, particularly natural gas prices, shot up when the, during the war. 
uh, in the summer and in anticipation of shortages during the winter and bunkers got full and you've had Europe's had a particularly warm fall, which means we haven't used as much natural gas as it was before. Some of that is panicked, you know, panic buying. But some of that is also a reflection of a fairly warm, and we haven't actually used it yet because we haven't really got into the guts of winter. Um, and for oil, yes, uh, I think well, I'm very bullish on oil and natural gas because I do think supplies will remain constrained for the next couple, two or three years. And the reason why I think this is a couple things. One is um, it's not that easy to ramp up oil and natural gas production, particularly after the eight years I've just, just described, because people have moved out of the industry. There's only so many people who have the requisite skills and drilling capacities and financial knowledge to be able to um, tap new supplies. And all of them are becoming progressively more expensive due to demand and inflation. So even if oil companies double their investment in oil and natural gas, that doesn't mean they're going to double output. You know, it, it, a lot of that is going to be eaten up, as it has in previous bulls, um, by inflationary costs of labor and steel and technique and all that stuff. So it tends to come, new supply tends to come as, at a river, at a, at a trickle, and then eventually you might, you'll get a flood, but it takes two or three years minimum for that to happen. Secondarily, in the middle of the bullish market for oil and natural gas, which we've seen in the last 12 months, it's kind of interesting, right? Uh, um, there's been a fallout in everything else in the stock market. Uh, the so-called FANG effect people talked about, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, were not doing so well lately. The tech flame out in crypto. People, I think, over the past eight years were more enthused by those sectors of the economy, particularly in their investment dollars, and thought oil and natural gas was on its way out. And what they would then do is say, OK, we're ESG friendly, environmental, social and governance. We won't invest in oil and natural gas companies. I think they're revisiting that right now because you still want to seek out return. And, you know, the investments in oil and natural gas due to the factors I've seen are going to continue to increase. And I think it's a good sector for returns. And yeah, because of the, you know, some of the things I've just talked about. So thank you. This is another one that is like uh, made for you from uh, our uh, viewer, uh, this is from Russia. So, um, how bad is the diesel shortage? Uh, is it just an US issue or it's global? Can they conjure uh, it somehow from somewhere? Uh, what's the reason of the, sto uh, of the shortage and what are the, reper the repercussions? Uh, if I can add to this question, we, uh, we are feeling uh, this shortage also in Italy because normally the diesel, it's Let's say we call like the, um, the, the, the gasoline, we call it benzina and the, uh, the gasoline the, uh, we call like the diesel uh, for, um, let's say for trucks or whatever, also for the cars. And that, uh, before uh, the diesel was about 10 or 12, 12 cents uh, less uh, uh, price of a um, regular gasoline, benzene in Italy. Now it's the opposite. Like uh, the gasoline and benzene, it's it's cheaper than the diesel, and it's very strange because like for the Italian market, uh, it's the first time uh, in the history where uh, like the two prices change uh, the 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 balance. Right. So, what is your point of view? Yeah. I know a little bit more about the North American answer to that question than the European one, but okay. I imagine there's a crossover, and I kind of agree with what I've just heard. I own a diesel Volkswagen. And I also now own a bicycle because <laughs> I can't afford I can't afford to fill it up. I mean, the price of gasoline in Canada is about a dollar. You know, it plunged to about 60 cents a liter during the pandemic. But that's kind of an odd time. And right now it's running about a dollar 65 a liter. The price for diesel fuel usually was about 20 cents more than the price of gasoline. Um, so when during the pandemic, it was about 80 cents a liter. And normally you'd expect that if a gas gasoline price is $1.40, you know, diesel price is $1.70 a liter. Well, now it's topping $3 a liter uh, for diesel fuel. 
and uh, so it's very expensive. In but a liter Canada. or a gallon? A liter. Uh, so it's it's more expensive in Canada than in Italy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we also have a lot of. This is again. This is Canada. We got a lot of real estate. Taxation. Yeah, and but 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 it's it, it, in in the in the real cost for liter of gasoline and and uh, and diesel. How much is the percentage of the national taxation in Canada, for example? Good the, question. Uh, it's about eighteen initially, but we've also got a federal government that wants to put another carbon tax on top of that. Okay. And there's a big political debate in Canada about whether he should do that or not, given the fact we're in the middle of a very high inflationary environment and probably a recession. The answer to the question in North America about the shortage of diesel has to do with refineries. Um, we, the United States, shut down two or three of them, mothballed them during the pandemic, um, and regulatory restraint on reopening them has been fairly heavy. And we also have, one of the things underlying a lot of this is we're starting to get a recovery of supply chains in the globe. I was reading this morning in the Wall Street Journal that stores in the United States for the first time in two years have lots of product. Well, that product has to come from somewhere. Um, and, and usually it's brought there on a truck. So you've had a vast increase in the volume of trucking activity, particularly in North America, and almost all of them run on diesel fuel. So, and that's happened over the past three or four months and we're getting into the holiday season. So the demand for diesel, particularly in North America, has just shot through the roof and, it's, and our refinery capacity for it has actually decreased. And we haven't put a whole much away because I don't think anybody anticipated the supply chain issue to, be, to become what it is now. So, I mean, you'll get some more investment and you'll get some more opening up of diesel fuel because the pro the profitability is enormous, but it's going to take six, eight months. So, you know, it's going to take a while for enough new diesel to come on the market. Until that time, it's it's going to be pretty expensive. So, next question. Uh, what do you think about the European Union gas oil dependency from Russia before uh, February yeah. 20, 20 second and and for the rest like the other side the russian gdp dependency on on export on europe yeah that's a really interesting question i'll try to explain it as best, from my perspective as best i can it's, very, it's a lot of moving parts but, uh, if i can david add to this one also that one like to, because it's connected what could be the russian uh, future uh, uh, role on the world of oil and gas market can india and china replace the western market in the event of a, a total russian ban uh, that will start like in december now temporarily but we don't know how much it will be last yeah okay so even even when, this, when the Cold War was ending, and for the 30 years since that time, there's been an interesting dynamic, particularly between Germany and Russia, which basically goes like this. Germans need, and Europe wider, but mainly need gas, and Russia needs money. And those two things are not going to change, no matter what else might be happening in the world politically. And... If you take a look, and, and you know, there's a scholar at Harvard that's written a lot on this named Tane Gustafson. He said, basically, his argument was, you know, this is a business relationship that has been friendly and equitable for 50 years, and regardless of what might be happening elsewhere, that it will like. And you get these pictures of, you know, recent business meetings, dinners afterwards, handshakes, and you know, do you agree on the price for the next two or three years? And so I think there was an inherent belief that that would continue no matter what, uh, because both sides benefited from it. And I think there were there were warnings. I issued them, some of them, some did others, that the construction of Nord Stream, for example, and the continuation of building of pipelines directly to Europe from Russia constituted a real threat of vulnerability. Because what happens if and when Russia decides or won't turn on the gas? Um, no one really thought they ever would because they were so enormously dependent and still are really on shipping gas towards Western Europe. 
So there's that sort of thing I mentioned earlier, both supplier and demand have vulnerabilities. You know, Russia, you know, Germany and Western Europe need gas, but Russia needs money badly. And we're sort of on what I'm seeing now in the case of the war, and you're seeing this in news all the time, is there's sort of a who's going to crack first? You know, the Russian economic elite who are seem to be dropping off fairly regularly in terms of their in terms of their lifespan. I mean, there's a lot of that going on in Russia. Or how long can Russia and Western Europe withstand not having Russian gas? Now, I think I would I would put my bet on Western Europe being able to withstand it for a long while because you know, we can get more to get natural gas from you know, the United States increasingly will do some. Maybe Canada might even get into that game. So this could all be moot. The war may end tomorrow and the natural gas might be turned back on and we won't be talking about this okay. in, in uh, after Christmas, maybe. But, but for now, that's where we are. Yes, India and China need, their primary concern is providing energy security for themselves to ensure the growth of their own people in terms of economic and I, I don't think they're particularly worried about where they get it from. And I, I don't, and I think they're going to remain fairly neutral in the dispute or the war in Ukraine because it, it, there isn't at present there, there isn't a particular reason why they would want to be heavily involved in that because they've got these other things to worry about. I think the same problem for those countries is the same problem North America and Europe has faced, which is you don't want to be overly dependent on any one supplier ever. And that doesn't change. Uh, Mr. Churchill said this in 1905, right? Well, maybe it wasn't 1905, but security in oil and gas relies in variety and variety alone. So yes, they can absorb increasingly Russian natural gas and oil. But they're also going to want it from a from Saudi Arabia and Iran and Iraq. I mean, they want it from everywhere because of the size of their economy and the amount of growing they're likely to do. So um, the world's going to be dependent on a good long while yet. Uh, if I can uh, show you like these pictures, it's like uh, the pipelines that, that go to, to Europe from Russia. And it's interesting because uh, this scenario uh, changed a lot in Europe from uh, from the end of the last year because before the biggest part of gas was coming from the north, and uh, actually uh, it's it's the opposite because if we look uh, like uh, our alternatives, it's mainly U.S. from LNG. This is the next question that I wanted to give to you. Qatar, Norway, Australia, Canada, like uh, uh, Algeria, Nigeria, and whatever. Uh, what we saw that it's changing, especially from the Italian point of view, is that Italy it's becoming a little bit a new platform for uh, importing gas, especially like from Libya, Algeria, and there is a new agreement between uh, Italy and Egypt and Israel to use like the Mediterranean Sea as a hub uh, and Italy for uh, like a gas hub for the rest of Europe. And, but uh, connecting these uh, like, and also using TAP uh, to connect uh, like Azerbaijan uh, through Turkey uh, and uh, Southern Italy. But um, about like, uh, this is, was uh, the, the question connected also that could be usable for the case of US and, and Canada and Europe. Uh, what can be the role of uh, uh, LNG uh, in the West, uh, in the new Western ener energy strategy? Because the big question that I have everybody give to me, it's like uh, that how can it be a substitute for pipeline gas uh, given the higher price of LNG? It could be what 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 part uh, can have LNG in our strategy? Yeah. Okay. A couple of things on that, and this is one of the things that um, was kind of revealed in in those pipeline issues you just talked about is um, there is a struggle in, in the gas market about modes of delivery and which one you should rely upon. Um, getting back to the the german russian thing i talked about earlier it's easy to have a longer term relationship with on a pipeline basis because you have to you know you are guaranteeing a certain amount of delivery and a certain amount of purchase of gas price at a certain price that justifies all the effort it took to build the pipeline 
Now, what has been happening over the past 20 years and perhaps a bit longer is this movement towards a much more liquid market. And liquid, I mean, when you got gas on a ship, it can go anywhere and it can be it can be redirected and it can be moved. And all it really matters is it becomes much more of a spot market pricing mechanism. You move it around. Um, so the currently, I would suspect that a big chunk of the increase in liquefied natural gas has been to do this demand spike that we just talked about earlier related to Europe, wanting to fill their, their tanks and wanting to get lots of folks and lots of other places wanting it too. And the concern about pipelines not being so over time, you know, you would probably think as we work this out that those two sources will equalize in terms of prices uh, because you, you, you're trying to make a real market. What that will do to ongoing investments in new pipeline infrastructure is an open question. All right. You, you might see a really bifurcated market. This is something I'm thinking through. I haven't got any conclusions on yet where you where Russia may try to replicate its pipeline strategy that it had with Western Europe to Russia, to India and, and China and have a lot of long-term contracts for them because they need security of supply and they're probably willing to pay for the guarantee. Whereas Europe will have a much more diverse market-based centric structure that allows the pricing to be more evenly distributed. And, you know, you know, has much more ports open to imports from the Mediterranean and from Canada, and North America and, and wherever else you get much more. You might have a real robust market there and a more pipeline driven strategy to the east. Over time, I would think the prices should equalize a bit because as you get sort resources, if you got a higher price for LNG, more money is going to flow to it and that'll eventually bring the price down. So, uh, p -p 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 this one from the public, but it's another question that I receive everybody, every time. Like, are there a, a, a potential for a serious alternative to petrodollar being created? And uh, what will be the effect on the dollar? This is like connected to like the speculation of, for example, the extension of the BRICS to Saudi Arabia and Argentina and whatever. What do you think about this? Well, there's been talk about diversification away from the U.S. dollar forever. Um, I would argue that was one of the primary motivations, for example, of creating the euro. Um, it was to facilitate internal transactions within Europe, sure. But it was also trying to create an alternative currency that could be used for international trading purposes that sort of broke us away from this overwhelming dependence on the U.S. dollar because a lot of the rest of the world didn't really trust what the Americans were doing with that responsibility of having to, of the reserve currency. I mean, they were spending huge amounts of money cutting taxes and everyone was worried about their reserve holdings kind of falling through the floor if they held too many dollars. So I do think that the effort to diversify global reserve currencies, however measured, is, is ongoing and probably justified given that currently we rely too much on the U.S. dollar than we should, given its relative power. You know, we've, we were some, it's something like 80% of the world's reserves. It probably should be around 40 or 30 or whatever, but it wasn't, shouldn't be 80. Unfortunately, all the other alternatives have challenges with them that are reluctant and particularly heightened in terms of stress like we're in right now. People always flock to the U.S. dollar when we've got times of economic uncertainty, because where, where else are you going to, to go? I mean, the European, the Euro has its classic problems of being, you know, you can't control the fiscal policy of the states, so you don't know the debt level, so it's a little bit unsure. We don't quite know how other currencies are determined. Um, and do you really want to place economic bets on the Chinese currency? And, that carries with it a lot of other risks, mainly transparency and whether or not you can get your money out. So in order for people to fully trust some other mechanism for pricing international agreements, these other problems have to be solved. Perhaps that's what the movement to the BRICS expansion is, but it's, you know, it's gonna take a while for people to get enough trust in other modes of currencies before they'll significantly break the US dollar.
Okay, then this one that we we had like this uh, news about the OPEC plus cut. Uh, uh, do you think that it's something more political or it's technically connected to uh, the forecast of a technical recession in the next year? Well, the Saudis always say it's a technical economic decision and nobody ever believes them. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it, it's sort of built into to, to the game. Um, sure. You could argue that um, there is there is recession talk in Europe and North America, their major export markets, and China, and that therefore, you know, flooding the market with excess oil is going to hurt them own their own finances because it's going to essentially drive, you know, no, there will be no demand anyway, and prices will go through the go, go low. Um, but there. You know, there's other things going on as well. I think Saudi Arabia still wants to keep prices fairly high for its own fiscal reasons. It also wants to prevent as far as possible what we saw in 2014, which was the rise of massive production in the United States, which could easily happen, you know, if, if prices are too high for too long. Um, and they also, I think, want to flex their independence a little bit. Um, which they did in the fall with the, with uh, Biden's visit to Saudi Arabia. Um, I, I think they, they want to show that they are still critical to the U.S. national security. And they I think they're flexing a little bit, to put it mildly. Um, so, you know, it, it's both. But at the end of the day, that decision is not probably not made by the Saudi Arabian energy minister. It's probably made it higher up the chain for political purposes. But I saw that actually the, the decision of a cut of OPEC plus didn't change a lot about the market prices because uh, we yeah. we didn't see any type of effect uh, about this cut. And I saw that officially the cut was, uh, let's say, ineffective because uh, the demand was less of the production. And so I mean, you have things like the strategic petroleum reserves. Well, we'll just go to use those and dump some more into the market, which was a stopgate measure, but it probably moderated the, the cut. Uh, one about renewable from the public. I think we will take the last two, three, and then we close before the hour. Uh, is there a, uh, some kind of magical potential in variable renewables? I'm I'm just uh, not seeing. I see a deeply fossil fuel der uh, derivative energy source not dispatchable with low capacity factor, with uh, no storage solution to fix that. Uh, with probably large uh, footprint and high resource investment consisting in a large number of independent units, 24 hour environments. I mean, why are we pursuing this? And if I can add, uh, like, uh, for example, I just returned back from Japan. I stayed there 20 days for some conferences and a little bit of tourism. I was interested because, I don't know, now in Italy, especially in my city, Brescia, it's the third uh, city uh, and market for Tesla and electrical cars in Italy. We have Rome, Milan, Brescia, the third. And there is a huge market about, for example, uh, uh, electric recharge point like Italy now it's exploding in this market in I, I saw in Japan where is zero nothing I did and, and for me it was a a, a a shock because I thought that Japan was like I don't know investing so much in the electric and the renewable and I saw that the internal market it's more like hybrid but not full electric very few electric car recharging points mm -hmm. And uh, zero Tesla in Tokyo, so one Tesla. I don't know. It, it, it was a shock for me. And what, what is like your, your point of this maybe greenwashing that we had in the West about, uh, I don't know, the magical uh, salvation of uh, the electrical cars and the renewable uh, sources? Yeah. Um, how can I say this? In, in a way that's fair. I, I think, and this is just drawing upon what I saw in Europe and in North America, I think 
the public utterances of political leaders and environmental enthusiasms have overpromised and underdelivered what renewables are currently capable of doing. And um, and I think they misplaced the boat a little bit, cut in a couple of reasons. First of all, we have to be accurate, for example, about the environmental impact of a Tesla. Is it any better than an internal combustion engine car when you take everything into account? Um, the answer is not obvious. The uh, Yes, it doesn't burn carbon, but it also has a massive battery that's got strategic minerals in it that had to be mined and makes a lot of energy to get the mining out. And what are you going to do with the batteries when they're done? And you got to build charging stations. And where's the electricity going to come from? So we have to be full and fair and account for carbon and for non-carbon based on their environmental impact to be fair about it. I think the reason people buy Teslas is they like them. They're cool cars. <laughs> So what I, and this has always been my kind of uh, pitch, is I'm, I'm a much bigger believer in the market being able to do this than, than people realize. I mean, people will embrace environmental solutions if they provide them the same level of comfort and cost as other things do. And, they, and, and, and that's what entrepreneurs do. They figure things out. And they also, as you mentioned, you know, I, th I think people think of innovation as sort of a linear process. You get X amount of investment and you get Y amount of output and it just kind of goes up like that. But that doesn't seem to be the, what the history of innovation tells us about adopting new products. It tends to be slow enough, you invest a lot, you invest a lot, invest, you don't think you're getting anywhere and then it jumps up. And then it, and then it massive, then you figure out a, a group of technologies that solve these collective problems, like the question was asking about storage, about transmission, about what do you do when there's no sun, and how do you figure out consistent, and, and then it jumps up. And you probably might be getting parts of that in Europe because they've been so far ahead on this. I mean, Europe has been pushing green energy and in terms of much longer and much more powerful political constituents, and they're ahead. Well, good for you. Well, great. <laughs> That's awesome. But uh, but if I can add to what you said, Tesla are a very cool car, but uh, let's say also very expensive. Like, I don't yeah. know. In Italy, actually, if you want to buy a new Tesla, first you have like, I don't know, eight months of waiting list first. Yeah. Second, uh, like uh, uh, Tesla Model 3 used, used, it's about 45,000 euros used. Yeah. A new one, it's over 60,000. Who can afford this? Like, if I uh, made it like, and, and the, the average salary in Italy, uh, it's it's about uh, 1,400 net. So nobody can afford except like rich people. Uh, and uh, this thing, it, it's interesting for me uh, if... Uh, uh, there uh, will be a market uh, that it's for small cars usable in the city, like city cars or whatever. Yeah. I saw a lot of that, uh, for example, in Japan, uh, Nissan or whatever, small cars. But big cars with big batteries, uh, with big uh, autonomy, that it's, I don't know, expensive and uh, I don't know, not disposable probably because, as you said, like the cost of the battery and whatever, uh, it's uh, not... Uh, environmental friendly in, in the long term uh, it could be an interesting issue uh, one let me I have like one question but it's very complicated to give to you like uh, uh, maybe, maybe the last or the, the, the so uh, how far we are from from a 40 moment for a nuclear energy uh, so the, the plants could be mass producible um, can I temp chemistry replace the natural hydrocarbons if I can add to this question from the public when I was in China I went for four years for conferences there was like a uh, an interdisciplinary conference. I was talk about waste. I have a lot of people called that was called by energy, and there there was uh, one uh, that that was proposing to the Chinese micro nuclear plants, micro reactor. Uh, could the solution uh, affordable for the new strategy to make the right mix for these energies, like part oil and gas, part uh, renewables? Part steel nuclear. What is your opinion about it? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, I, I do think nuclear has got a bad rap, 
and, and, and has got, has, there's a lot of public opposition to nuclear, which I don't think is entirely justified. I mean, it's clearly the image of it portrayed by, Hugh, by Hollywood movies and the Fukushima and Chernobyl is that this is an enormously dangerous source of energy that if it goes, it is likely to go be a problem and cause big problems. The reality is nuclear energy is one of the safest ways to produce energy in the, the number of deaths associated to nuclear plants is very, very small. And um, the problem that we are having, a couple of problems. One is this is political opposition to it. Two, people think of nuclear plants as these gigantic things that, you know, provide power for half a country. And, you know, um, when in fact, if you improve their design, as you're talking about with small modular reactors, they, you don't have to run. It's not that expensive and it's not, you know, massively trying to dominate an entire portion of the economy. And it can be managed relatively safely. Um, the safety records are pretty, are quite good. It's not that easy to convert nuclear material that was being used for energy to nuclear material that's used for a weapon. It's not, that's not a simple, that's not an easy thing. And, um, you know, that's one of the things you, you mentioned earlier about Teslas. Well, the example I have in my head is a cell phone. In 1990, 2000, these things were $3,000 and they're bricks and they're ugly and 10 people in the country had one and they were really cool. Then we figured out how to make them smaller, how to make them lighter and how to build a network that supports 100 million of these things that everybody has. Um, I would argue that that sort of process is what we want to see in in energy development too. And it's smaller, it's, you know, it's in innovation figures out if we let people innovate, how to do things, how to do things better, cheaper, and safety. Every, the whole history of industrial development proves we can do this. So I don't see why it wouldn't happen for energy if we let it happen. And so I got enormous hope for nuclear if we can overcome the public stigma. That's the big, big problem. Perfect. So uh, I think it was uh, an amazing answer to my to my question and from the public. Uh, I think we that we reach uh, all the questions that I received. Uh, so uh, we stayed we stayed under the, the hour. So it was perfect. Uh, thank you so th thank you so much. Please stay one second after I close. Sure. And uh, to all the public that will see the the video after the live. Uh, please uh, uh, subscribe to the channel, like the video if you like our content. If you have any other question, uh, please put in the comments. Uh, we will update you um, as soon as possible after uh, uh, this uh, session of speeches about the geopolitical school, but probably uh, we will do it uh, the second or the third week of October 2023. I hope that we will have uh, the Professor De Tomasi in our uh, um, speech list, so uh, in Italy. And uh, for who watched like this live now, we will have another live in, in two hours. Uh, with uh, Can News for TOF, it will be only about military, so it will be a, a, a little uh, less academic and more uh, like uh, military about Ukraine. So uh, thank you so much to the public uh, that stayed in the live and thank you to the professor to give uh, us uh, uh, one hour of uh, his time and for the presentation. I hope that you like uh, the video and see you in the next streams. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.